Good day. My name is Dan Everett. I am a Senior Director at SAP, and I'd like to welcome you to this webcast. One question that I often get asked is, how do we establish a, a data governance strategy or, or a program? And fortunately, today we have Bruce Be Beatty from um, CSL Bearing and John Ferrioli from Utopia to explain how they established data governance at CSL Bearing. So Bruce, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Dan. So first I'd like to just introduce CSL Bearing. Um, we are a biopharmaceutical company and we uh, produce products to treat rare and serious diseases. I'll talk a little bit more about those um, in some of the um, following slides. But in the um, agenda for today, uh, as I said, I'll introduce the company and then I'll talk about the initiative that we've had here at CSL Bearing, um, kind of where, where we came from, uh, what the technical environment was very briefly, and then where we are today and where we're going, because it is an evolution, it's not a project. Um, and also, and then we'll end with some key learning points as we go through this. So CSL Bearing, we are a global leader in our industry. It's a kind of a niche um, part of the pharmaceutical area in that all of our products are made from human plasma, um, and we use these products to treat the rare and serious diseases. Um, what you see depicted on these pictures is actually our supply chain. The gentleman on the left is actually one of our raw material suppliers where he's donating plasma in one of our plasma collection centers where we then take um, our product through extensive testing, um, high-tech uh, purification um, uh, processes to get it to our patients. We treat a number of different types of disorders. In terms of the company, we're in about a $20 billion industry. I'm sorry, I got uh, one slide ahead here. Uh, we're in about a $20 billion industry, and uh, we have, for the most part, we collect our own plasma through our own internal network. We are part of CSL Limited, which is an Australian um, headquartered company. And our headquarters were, is for CSL Bearing, where I'm working, is in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. We have multiple manufacturing facilities and multiple research facilities. Our key therapeutic areas, coagulation, uh, if you're familiar with hemophilia, where people are not able to stop bleeding, um, is one of the products areas that we have. Immunology, if you remember the uh, movie with John Travolta about the boy in the bubble, um, that's another um, therapy we have where we collect the uh, antibodies that are circulating in, in our plasma donors' um, plasma. We, we purify those, concentrate them, and then uh, those can allow uh, patients that have uh, immune disorders to have a normal life and be able to be out in public um, is another area. So these are some of our key areas uh, of different therapies that we have. All of these products come from the human plasma. So as a company, we're very committed to our um, patients and to the safety of our products and the quality of those. Uh, we go, we've spent a significant amount of money on our research and de development activities. And we also provide a lot of support um, for our patients. All of our products basically are injectable. Um, they're, not, uh, they're either for use in a hospital or for a home setting, uh, but through injections. We have our core values where we really are focused on the customer and we looked at how can we be innovative and in all of our, both our, our production processes as well as in terms of our support for our customers. And in terms of superior performance is really a key area where our enterprise data management initiative comes in. Some of their goals really tie back to that um, key point, which is how can we improve our productivity and our cost effectiveness? So some of the ways we can do that is having better information for our procurement group to um, leverage our buying power, understand where we're sp um, spending, um, and then what can we do to um, negotiate uh, better opportunities there, not just from a cost perspective, but also from a quality perspective. And it, if we have our master data under control, we can make our implementation of systems much easier. Right now, we're in the process of implementing Ariba um, for our purchasing area. But also, if your master data is a higher quality, you have more trust in the reports um, that are being generated out of the system, and we can start to get people to stop relying on those offline Excel spreadsheets that they may be keeping today. Um, and at the bottom line really is also what can we do to reduce the time we spend creating and managing the lifecycle of our data? And that's really part, 
part of what we're going to talk about today is what are we doing, where have we come from uh, to be able to deliver on that. So we'll come back to these key learning points at the end, but just really wanted to give you a, a first quick view of them. And really it's starting out simple is an important part. Get to understand your data, um, understand what you can do with it, narrow down the focus to really what's important, and be able to communicate about that. And then ultimately you may want to implement some technology to assist in that. The last point is very important, which is the business owns the data, not IT. So we have to engage them in, in both understanding it, defining it, and then managing it. Now I like to use the, um, as a vision statement, um, you know, and, and tie it to the spark plug. When I think about my car, if my spark plug is fouled, I'm not going to be able to, to rely on my vehicle to get me to work, uh, to get me to where I want to go. It's going to be inefficient. It's going to you know, be a gas guzzler. I'm not going to trust it. So really what I look at it is for master data is the same thing. I want my master data to be as clean as possible so it's efficient, it's trustworthy, um, it's going to get me to where I need to be on time and at the lowest possible cost. And that's really our focus here at CSO Buried in terms of what, where we're trying to go with our master data initiative. For a moment, just on our technical environment, in 2007 we had three different SAP 4.6 um, installations, um, and that was really due to our growth in acquisitions. Um, even though we're over different parts, over 100 years old, it's come together over time as, um, as an evolution of through acquisitions. So three different 4.6 systems, and we, in 2008 we migrated into a single instance globally for uh, SAP 6.0 ECC. So that was both a technical consolidation as well as a upgrade at the same time. But really, um, that was the focus. There wasn't a lot of time spent to harmonize or clean up master data at that time. So a lot of the sums of the past were brought forward into the new system. In our Australian operations, we have BPICS, and we still have it today, although we are entering into a project where we're going to start to transfer the activity from BPIX into our single instance of SAP. And as time's gone on, we also have implemented other systems. We have um, ongoing legislation for reporting. The Sunshine Act for pharmaceuticals uh, is another point. Um, of course, there's other compliance reporting from the financial side. So the importance of our master data continues to increase, and the complexities continue to increase over time. So that's really kind of where we are, where we've come from and where we are today from a technical environment from SAP. So where we were at, at um, just before the go live of the ECC6 system is our steering committee said, you know, we need to put in place a program to keep the data quality from going backwards. They recognized the importance of it, although we didn't take the time or spend the money as part of that upgrade um, consolidation project to deal with the master data. They at least recognized we need to make sure we don't go backwards. So the charge was given, hey, we need to put something in place, a data governance program in place, to make sure that we're going to be um, not going backwards and we want to move forwards. So as CSL looked at this um, and looked at what we had for in-house knowledge, we recognized we really didn't have a, a good base of knowledge or experience in this area, so we engaged Utopia uh, to come in and help give us some guidance on strategy around master data governance. At this point, I'll turn it over to John Ferrioli. Thanks, Bruce. I uh, appreciate uh, everyone joining the conference today. And um, what I'd like to do is share with you how we teamed up with Bruce and the team at CSL Bearing and um, brought forward this program roadmap for enterprise data management. The, uh, the journey, as Bruce just talked about, has been going on with CSL since the beginning of 2009, and it's, it's progressively designed um, to map to the organizational readiness uh, within the company. Um, so just going in with a, with a roadmap but not designed specific for CSL uh, is definitely not a, a best practice. But at Utopia, just a little bit about who we are, we, we are a global services and consulting firm, and we're focused on delivering uh, the life cycle of data, um, what we call data to insights. So every aspect from Actionable insights uh, depends on reliability and integrity of the source data, things that Bruce talked about, about trusting the reports versus just Excel spreadsheets. And we also feel data is the foundation uh, for the organization's informational management roadmap. 
Um, our approach is uh, is laid out in front of you in simplest terms. It gets a lot more sophisticated, but the roadmap that we've put in place with CSL was first to establish a, a data management strategy. This is an appreciation of who the key players are, uh, their roles, their responsibilities, um, their ability um, to, to affect change. And then as we go down the roadmap, once the people and process are in place, then we can start to automate those policies. So we want to understand the data, getting our arms around um, key metrics of, of data performance. We want to get the data clean. We then want to keep the data clean, right, to maintain and sustain. And then from a lifecycle perspective, manage it um, as an asset through its archival, through its end of life, so that whole enterprise lifecycle approach. Um, from a deliverables perspective, one of the things we, we were tasked to do and, and charged to do by Bruce and the leadership at CSL um, was to help them establish the initiative. Uh, as Bruce mentioned, we didn't want the data to go backwards. So um, with that SAP consolidation, there were still uh, SAP and non-SAP systems. We wanted to have a foundation and infrastructure for enterprise data management across the classic people process and, of course, enabling technology. Um, we wanted to get organizational buy-in, so not just people speaking about data, but actively understanding its importance as the foundation for all of their business process optimizations, as well as their key performance indicators and business drivers. Some of the deliverables we brought forward were, you know, just off the bat is what does the organization look like? What's the risk and readiness assessment of the organization? Are you ready for enterprise data management? Um, how do you mitigate those risks? Getting and achieving uh, not only stakeholder buy-in, uh, but long-term executive sponsorship. Uh, and then what about the infrastructure? What are the EDM, enterprise data management, best practices? What about the reference architecture? What's going to work best um, at CSL? So our approach is uh, a couple of ways we go about this is from a top-down with people and the organization behind it, and then bottom up. Now, I think everyone is probably familiar with one degree or another of a maturity model. Uh, we have one, and it's well-defined. But the key message around the maturity model is to truly understand organizationally where the key stakeholders see data. So we analyzed with CSL, uh, and I was part of the delivery organization at the time, understanding people's appreciation across these key uh, metrics. So what does governance look like today at CSL Bearing? What about data management? How about um, you know, business reporting? Uh, what about uh, data sponsorship and stewardship? Um, so we were able to assess the current uh, appreciation through interviews and workshops and getting people involved to understand the economic impact of data, right? Can I achieve a reduction in day sales outstanding if my accounts receivable people um, aren't dealing with invoices that are inaccurate or that the tax ID is uh, erroneous? And that would have then affect people paying their bills on time. So we wanted to draw economic tie-ins to some of the things Bruce talked about around strategic sourcing, around compliance to the uh, physician spend management and, um, and, uh, and, and compliance tracking and other uh, supply chain drivers. From that current assessment, and as a best practice for data governance and getting the team on board as to why data matters, we were able to map out where the organization, the key stakeholders, had as far as a desired target. We also then mapped economic drivers to those improvements. So in other words, are you able to achieve a 360-degree view of your customer for cross-selling and upselling your customer? if the data improves, if you have a single view of the customer across all your transactions and, and master data. And so that desired target gives people a goal, and then we can progressively map to that goal. And so that's really the effort in enterprise data management is how do you get to the next level? How do you, how do you recognize those benefits and sustain the, uh, the momentum of an enterprise data management initiative? One way that we did this, again, was key stakeholder analysis. And what you can see from this bottom layer uh, in orange and red is was the original assessment from the team at, at CSL. And we scorecard based on a maturity model and then laid out 
what is the value of moving to the next level if you invest, if you support Bruce and his organization? So they have an active uh, participation in Bruce's success. So when he says, I need to define standards for our vendor master, you can rest assured that the procurement organization will actively participate with the data management organization to team together along with IT to, to get that insight needed not only to get the data clean, but to keep it clean. So scorecarding is important, and it's a good measurement on your progress over time. You can benchmark yourself year over year over year uh, with this maturity model and framework. So we applied that at CSL. The other thing is, is that there are some core blocking and tackling uh, elements for data management. And, um, and this was actually created by many, many, many companies, peer companies, um, where we, they looked at what are the most important elements for enterprise data management and was illustrated here with um, this, this wheel of, of, uh, of, of solution components. So architecture, where, when, and how is the data you know, extended? Is it created? Is it approved? What's the architecture behind the data? What are the data standards? For example, how do you abbreviate St. John Street? How do you abbreviate uh, the Coca-Cola company, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola Inc., Coca-Cola Limited, or LTD with a period. So standards are important for all of your elements, whether it's a material master, customer, vendor master, or any other object. The governance organization is critical, too, as we established the organization and the roles and responsibility. Who sets the data policy? And then who's the approvers behind it? Um, quality is a incredibly important element because you need to go back to management as part of your business case and show them the data as evidence against the business case. And so if you show someone data quality metrics that are not being met, you can rest assured that there will be concern about whether the decisions being made against the, that, uh, that SAP or non-SAP process or the insight from the, from the analytics or the report is suspect or not. So tracking quality metrics is, is another key dimension. And the last is change management. Change management is the culture of how do you get people buy in, not only for a project, but ultimately a data management process. So all these elements are core uh, components of an, of an orchestrated and holistic enterprise data management uh, offering. The last slide I'll share is the governance structure that we put in place because really data governance is in fact the enforcement and automation of your data policy. So working with Bruce and his team, we sought out to create a governance structure that would work best for CSL. There are numerous data governance structures. There's consolid there's there's lean data governance. There's um, structured, there's dealing with a federated model, there's centralized and decentralized. This model that worked best for CSL was based on a lean data governance model. And what I wanted to highlight before turning it over to Bruce was two key, key elements. One, enterprise focus highlighted in yellow on top. These are the key stakeholders, the steering committee, the data trustees. These are the owners of and enforcers of the process. On the bottom hand, you have the operational side of the business. And these are the folks like the data trust, uh, excuse me, the data stewards, the data custodians. They're more on the execution side of the, of the fence. So it's getting multiple stakeholders, some at an executive level, on the top line at the enterprise level, the steering committee, all the way down through the data custodian who's maintaining and managing the data in the production systems. What I did want to note is the processes are different, right? So you're getting a lot of folks across the organization, one, to care about data and the economic impact, but ultimately to be involved actively in the governing of the architecture, the authorization of standards, the assignment of accountability, and the, and the quality monitoring. In, in gray, in the operational, when you're in the trenches, it's much more about the design of the architecture, the creation of new records, right? Um, when you create that next version of the record, is it valid? Does it have the mandatory fields? Uh, 
Who's responsible for the creation of company codes? Who's responsible for the creation of tax ID and entering of tax ID so that it's valid, so that you don't run into that day sales outstanding issue with a bad invoice? So we designed the, the org structure that would work best within the CSL culture, that showed economic impact, and then ultimately had the right steering committee through execution level that it could be sustainable and, and, uh, and, and has been so for the past four years. I'm going to turn it back over to Bruce to give a little bit more color on this slide, and then we'll walk you through the journey uh, that we've been on uh, for the last few years. Bruce? Thanks, John. <clears throat> a couple points also on this slide. When you look at these different positions, with the exception of the enterprise architect, we have all of these being people from the business. So when we talk about a data trustee, we have one person globally responsible for an object, such as the vendor master. A data steward are, is the perhaps, um, in most cases, we have the head of purchasing at a manufacturing site would be a data steward. And then we have data custodians, or the hands-on keyboard people maintaining the, um, maintaining the, the vendor master themselves. So when I talk about um, developing standards, um, myself, and that's where you see me in the global business data officer, officer role, um, I'm working with a data trustee as the global lead and then the data stewards from the different sites, essentially one person from each site, to, to define what are those standards, what can we do to harmonize those rules and standards and apply those, and then the data stewards are responsible to make sure that actions are taken to clean up the data locally and that the data custodians are, are trained or retrained as necessary for any changes that we might make in our master data standards. Now, just another quick comment. Um, you see myself, the Global Business Data Officer, and then I have a data analyst position I'm reporting to. I have, actually have two of those. This is what we have in terms of a kind of a centralized organization, myself and two analysts, where we're providing essentially a shared service to the business across all sites and across um, uh, and the goal is even across all applications. Um, this is where we're starting out with. It doesn't mean that we're doing all the maintenance ourselves. And in fact, myself and my two analysts, we do not have access to change any data or add data. But what we're doing is facilitating, as a shared service, um, this, the establishment of the standards, the identification of non-conforming records, and communication of those back to the business. And then where mass maintenance maybe is appropriate, we can help to facilitate that. Um, with the IT organization. So very much uh, here at CSL, it's, IT, sorry, it's the business that owns the master data, responsible for it to define it, for the rules for it, and to maintain it. So as John said, we, you know, we started back in 2009 with the engaging them to help with the strategy. Um, I was in, named on a part-time basis to be responsible for this without any analyst at that time in September. We then went through a series of exercises where I had Utopia come back in, help me get um, to, the next lot, to the next step, help me start to do some analysis. Um, I don't have the staff, I don't have the tools um, to do this, and I'm learning. My background, I trained in uh, accounting and then I and worked in finance within the company, then I moved into supply chain. So I do not have an IT background, I do not have a master data background. So I'm learning as I go as leader of the initiative. Um, so. Utopia has helped me to um, learn what I need to do, how to do it, brought some approaches to it, both from a strategy and also some tools from the execution. Um, so what we did is I initially had Utopia doing analysis for me, helping me to gather rules. And then as I add my, added my analyst and we implemented um, SAP Business Objects Data Services as a tool, um, Utopia taught myself and my team how we could then operate independently. We don't have to have them there with a with us all the time, although John would love to be here all the time, but he's not. Um, but he was able to teach us what we need to do. And I went full-time to lead the initiative in April of 2011, and now we here, here we are in September 2013. We just did our 11th full extract of data for um, our vendor master, which is the one we're the most advanced on. Essentially, we're doing an extract on a quarterly basis to check the compliance with, those, with our master data standards and rules and feed that back to this. And I'm going to talk more about that process of what we're doing with these data set captures. But really where we are now is we're getting to the next step of wanting to move to our 2B process, 
um, which is really going to be to start doing the automation, take the what we've gathered for the rules and now start to apply those to the business. Now, as we started out in 2009, um, what were our initial um, targets that we had? And this is really still it's a good guide for me to go back to. On the right-hand side, you do see people, process, technologies. That you have to address all of these different areas. But on the left side, you see more specific items that tie back to the strategy and, and that wheel that John was talking about with quality, standards, governance, organization, um, that we said this is really where we're going to start out with and start to work in these areas. It's not overnight. You can't do it all at once, but you have to start somewhere. And one of the things that we've um, used is a life cycle as we take an object, such as the vendor master. The first thing we did is we asked the business, what are your rules for master data? That's great. We got some of those. We then analyzed that, and we then communicate that to um, the business saying, okay, here's what we found, what's compliant, not compliant with your rules, and now you need to do the cleanup on this to remediate it, to bring it into compliance with the rules that you've defined. How long that's going to take is going to be dependent upon how bad is the quality or how good is the quality of the data that's already in the system, and how many resources and how much priority are they going to put on that. So I can't, you know, when I go to a data trustee, as that's what we start on a new object, I can't say how long this is going to take because we, we, we need to get into it first. But we also, um, as we go through the remediation, we'll then start to identify here's a 2B process that can make this more efficient going forward, and then we'll implement that 2B process, and then we can move into a maintenance mode where the number of non-conforming records, they'll still continue to pop up. We may add a, a, a rule from time to time or change a standard, then we'll need to do some cleanup. But over time, the ongoing effort will drop. And we, this is life cycle is what we're using um, across the different objects as we go. Now, when we first started out in 2009, I was, tar I was tasked with what we called the big five, vendor, customer, material, employee, and finance. And so what we've done is we've followed that life cycle going down the chart here, gathering the rules, analyze it through the profiling, um, testing the data, feed it back to the business so they can remediate it, start to look at the 2B design. And so we've going through those um, different steps, and we're working our way through the objects. Um, now, I've also added in reference data, because one of the things I identified was uh, reference data, which is master data used in master data. Um, we did not have governance in place. You might think of that as many of your T tables, payment terms. I found we had 639 payment terms in the SAP system. Um, Two-thirds of those are used in vendor masters. But I found that we had 11 different ways to say net zero and 10 different ways to say net 30. So putting in place governance around that is important as well. And as we're working our way through these first core five, now we're also moving into the secondary objects as well. But this pace at which we can move is dependent upon how many resources we as a company are going to invest in this and the priority that the business will put on that. So that becomes the negotiation with a steering committee as to how fast and how far do we go. Now, I'd like to share with you some of my experience was really there's three ways to look at the analysis stage. The first thing I do is I collect rules from the business. That's great. I'll get what knowledge I can from verbal conversations, questions, surveys, or from looking at existing documentation. So just very quickly, this is just an Excel sheet where we've summarized here are the different rules that we captured from the business on the left-hand side. We then applied that against our data sets. We came up with a number of non-conforming records for each of those rules. And this just summarizes on a couple pages in an Excel sheet. We can feed this back to the business as to, well, here's what we found and how does it compare to the prior time. And perhaps here's the action that should be taken. Now, what we're doing, especially as we're still early on in the initiative here at CSL, yes, a couple years, but it's an evolution. We're actually taking the output where we find non-conforming rules or non-conforming records for our rules, we're putting to what I've called a work package, which is simply it's a Word document that we stick on SharePoint so it's accessible to the users, where we can identify here's the rule, here's the data set we applied it against, and then what came, what came out of that. You know, here's a summary of what we found for non-conforming records. Here's uh, embedded within that, here's an Excel file of the non-conforming records that as I report this then to the data steward from each of the sites, they then can work with the data custodians locally to do the remediation effort. They're the ones that need to understand what the rules and standards are, what changes need to be made, and they need to execute those changes. So essentially on a quarterly basis, we're going through that process of 
taking our rules as we currently have them defined or any new rules and applying those to the data set. But that only gets you as far as people remember to tell you about our rules. So the other thing we've done is to look at how are the fields being used um, in general, but then also how are they um, the same or different between our different sites. Going back to, remember we had three different SAP 4.6 systems. We put them together, but we just didn't spend a lot of time in harmonization. So this is just an example of some of the data profiling we've done where this is just for the LFB1, um, which is the vendor master at the company code level, where we just I took that. On the left-hand side, you see the different fields that are within that table. And then it's just a simple record count analysis of where are they well used or where, where are they what I call the limited usage. So what you see in the vertical red box are those that either there's limited usage or, hey, every record has the same value, or in fact, that none of the records, um, none of the fields have been maintained anywhere. What does that tell me? If it's limited usage, then I ask the question, is there actually a business requirement why I'm using that? And I can look to see um, why is it that I've only used, in, you know, this example, um, you know, four records for uh, the clearing with customer. Is that, did someone just um, use that field because they could or they thought, they thought they needed to? Is there an actual business requirement? If not, let's remove the values and clean this up. And then looking forward to the, be more efficient, if I'm not using fields or I have a default value, why am I presenting those to the user? So as when I think about the 2B, how can I make my user experience uh, cleaner, more efficient? And I, that can be through suppressing fields I don't need to use where I can um, remove it, the screen clutter and I can also um, uh, reduce the opportunity for an invalid um, value to be maintained in a field. So I can improve the efficiency and the quality. And then the horizontal uh, uh, red box identified, well, 1,300 records that have been maintained. Well, it's a pretty good number, but when I looked into a little bit more detail, what I found is only one of my company codes are maintained at it. So this goes back to, as we did the technical consolidation, we did not harmonize the business processes. So I've got a business process at that one site. So what I'm seeing in the master data is a reflection of this different business processes. Now I take that back to my data trustee for the vendor master and I say, do you want to look at your business processes here? Do you want to harmonize those business processes between the sites? Or is there a best practice that we, in fact, should be using this more broadly? So that becomes a discussion with the business, not just about the master data, but also about the business process. Now, one of the other things is, you know, that we've looked at is it's important that we focus on, number one, those records of master data that are important to the business. And if a, uh, if a uh, record is no longer active, then I don't want to ask the business to spend time trying to clean it up. So for example, if I have a vendor master that is missing a telephone number, and we say, hey, every vendor must have a telephone number maintained, I don't want to go to the business and say, you have this vendor, you haven't used them in five years, you need to put a telephone number in. So what we do is we actually are using the flag, the deletion flag field within our master records to identify, here's a record we've, we've deemed to be inactive, which generally means not used in the past two years. We flag them for deletion in the master record. We then filter those records out for purposes of figuring out the non-conforming records that need remediation. So as we do that, the vendor master and at the material master, but then we also say, well, wait a minute, if I'm going, to, if, I, if I consider it to be inactive there, let me also look at my dependent objects like the purchasing information record or the source list and I should also be taking action there to inactivate or make inactive those info records and those source lists. Um, and when I think about, say, bill of material for Material Master, if I say it's something that is now inactive and I'm going to flag it for deletion at the Material Master level, I should also take action then at the, at the bill of material level to remove it from there as well. The focus being, let me get the business attention on those items that really make sense for them that um, is important for them and relevant for them. Now where we've come from as, as a business is we've really gone from where we were prior to the start of our initiative in 2009. Essentially we weren't doing monitoring of our data quality. If we found a mistake, <clears throat> and generally it was because of transaction or maybe a report just didn't look right, there'd be a research done, <clears throat> identify what the specific situation was with that record and we would then take the action to um, correct that one record. 
But when we talk about our 2B process, we want to move forward into the future, um, and we want to really go from not just monitoring it after it's in the system, but we, want, we even want them to go to the point where we're going to validate at point of entry <clears throat> to make sure that their, our data quality is high right from the beginning of creating that record. So that's really part of our goal is we want to get from where we've been doing nothing to validation of point of entry. Keep the data that um, keep bad data out of the system right from the beginning to the extent that we can. From the business process, we've been you know, manual, um, and in some cases we didn't even have documentation of, say, when I needed to add a vendor master. So we're looking at, as part of our 2B process design, how far do we want to take this with workflow to move us along um, so we can make it a more efficient process. So when we talk about a 2B process, we're really, really talking about going from standard SAP screens with all those different fields displayed to what can we do to have a more consolidated, um, fewer number of screens, fewer number of fields displayed, just what's relevant to the business, and then validate, validating that at point of entry. So we get to, to more of a real-time governance um, in, our, in our processes. So part of what we're doing, we've taken our experience as we got started on the vendor master, we've now taken that life cycle, those approaches the, for analysis, we're applying it to our different objects as we go through it. And as we, and as we take that from looking at it retrospectively for what's already in the system for those rules, we're now preparing to use those rules at point of entry going forward. We've also been gathering a lot of information about our, 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 our master data. So when I showed you that profiling table, I showed both here's what the user sees as field, in terms of a field name, but also here's the technical field name. And then here's the rules that we have that ties to that field and that technical name. So I can share that both with the business and with our, um, I, our SAP analyst. And I can also then identify where these fields are being used in interfaces. Now I can start to understand what is my upstream and downstream impact of this individual field of master data. So you know, right now we've been doing a lot of work in, unfortunately, Excel spreadsheets to start to pull this together. Um, so we really want to talk about, you know, for our 2B process, that's our next step. Now you might say, Bruce, why are you doing this in Excel? We, you can, uh, yeah, I can see where you're doing this, um, this profile in Excel. And need to keep in mind where we were when we, um, where we've been in our journey, we go back to 2000, um, eight when we did our system consolidation and we acquired um, a license to data services. It was the kind of the original version. So we're working with it with the technology licenses we have right now, but um, Dan's going to talk a little bit later about some of the further development SAP has um, four tools that have some does some of the same things that we're talking about, but we haven't yet implemented those tools. But there's that's really just you know more a factor of, of time than anything. So this is really kind of where we're going um, over over the next you know couple of years as we continue to go through the different objects. So and and Bruce, one one thing I'll add to that. This is John. Uh, one thing I'll add to that is that when you look at the the, the maturity, you know, it's, it's one thing to come in and say you should do this, you should do that, you should do all these things. You have to have the infrastructure, you have to have the people and the processes to find and the ability to execute. It's, I use an example of a football team. You know, um, uh, unfortunately, I'm a New York Jet fan, so I can't use uh, that example. But if you look at the ability of a professional football team to execute against, say, uh, a junior high school team, it's the same game, but it's a different level of ability to execute. So as CSL has gone through their journey, they've gone from very early stages where nothing was in place to using – tool sets to automate. So things like the precursor to information steward has been used very heavily. The data insight component of which is now information steward is being used to profile along with um, historical tools. Data services has been used to cleanse and, and consolidate and to deduplicate the data. So as the maturity goes forward, the next step is how do we ensure data integrity at CSL at the point of creation? Well, you're going to need your rules, you're going to need your standards, and you're going to need your policies to be enforced in a workflow. And there are solutions uh, available out there. We're doing this in a real-time data governance model. Um, but it's, it's, it's an evolution to help to automate against these things that, that we also think is a key, uh, 
key learning point at CSL. Thanks, John. So just to you know, summarize here, you know, if you're just getting started, start with something simple. Don't start with a material master. Trust me on that. It's a big one. Um, start with a vendor master if you can, or the, or the customer master. The customer master is more complex than vendor master, but get started with it. Um, really start to understand your data, um, understand what's being used, and then, as I mentioned earlier, figure out what's no longer use. Can you apply a rule with a business that says, if it hasn't been used in the past 24 months, it's probably not relevant to you anymore if I haven't done any transactions with it. So if not, filter that information out so you can really hone the business's attention on what's important to them. Um, metrics is, is very valuable to help, under, help people understand from the business, especially senior management, how important is this? When I went to them and said, hey, we're, we're doing 500 vendor creations per month globally, it's a big number um, you know, for us, you know, we think. But that's 500 opportunities for bad data to be entered into the system each, each month. So what can we do to you know, use that to leverage that to say, here's the risk that we have if we don't have good quality data and that will then you know, create problems in transactions and then also reduce the trustworthiness of the reporting. And don't rely just upon you know, the rules that you've been given. Look at you know, through the profile and look to see how else you can do this. Maybe there's difference in business processes that can be challenged or should be challenged, or maybe you're just going to have to recognize that there are some site-specific um, situations. Um, data services, as John said, you know, we're using kind of the early version of it, um, but it's, it's a useful tool. Um, my analyst that I have, um, especially my first analyst that I had working on it, um, did not have SQL training. Um, it was very helpful for him to get that SQL training. Um, just a couple day class and then the light bulb went off that said, okay, now I understand more what we have to do with that. The information steward, as I understand, um, perhaps he don't, doesn't have quite as much reliance on, the, on the, that type of programming um, type of background. But lastly, the business owns the data. Engage them. They own it. Um, they need to be responsible for it. Don't let them say, okay, we define it, but you have to, you have to maintain it. The business has to, be, has to be, take the responsibility and the accountability for the data what I and my team are doing is we're trying to help them through the shared service concept of understanding where they need, where they have issues, um, or we can help help them figure out where they do have issues with their data that's causing them problems in either transactions or reporting. So with that, um, I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to hand it over to, to Dan. But um, you do have both uh, my my contact information and John John Ferrioli's contact information here as well. So Dan? Thanks, Bruce. And thanks for sharing your experience and best practices. I know that that's valuable for uh, many people to you know, hear how other organizations have done it. As Bruce and John indicated, data governance is an organizational capability supported by processes, policies, people, and technology. <clears throat> Obviously, SAP is a technology provider. Uh, we have a comprehensive set of, of technology capabilities when it comes to information management. You can start with the capabilities that address your most pressing issues and then add capabilities uh, as needed. <clears throat> and we're very proud at SAP to say that we use our own software. Um, our own internal data governance organization won both the Nucleus Research ROI Award and the TDWI Best Practices Award in 2013. <clears throat> One of the requirements of data governance is to define enterprise standards and communicate those standards. So, um, you know, what should a, a customer record look like? you know, what are our business rules, some of those things that John and Bruce talked about. SAP Sybase Power Designer addresses uh, the three related uh, modeling markets and helps uh, with that modeling of enterprise standards and communication of those standards. I had the opportunity to talk to the head of enterprise architecture at Medtronic, a medical device manufacturer. And I had asked him what the biggest benefit of Power Designer was, and I thought he'd say something like, you know, the ability to integrate or the integration of data, business, and technology architecture models in, in a single, five, single unified kind of environment. 
but what he said was, he said, power designer is an awesome communication tool. And that kind of surprised me, and I asked him why, and he said, well, I have 20 data architects that work for me, and previously they spent about an hour a day um, talking to report developers or business analysts, telling them what information was available and where it was. And he said, now that we have Power Designer, I just, I just point them to the model, and my guys spend maybe 15 or 30 minutes a week answering those, those questions. Bruce and John also talked about the need to do profiling and to establish a data quality baseline. So in a recent industry analyst report, uh, SAP Information Steward scored very high in helping organizations discover what data assets exist, catalog those assets and their relationships, and assess overall quality. Uh, this is really a tool that's designed for the business user so that they can start to take ownership for data quality themselves. Uh, it's very easy to create a, a business rule for, for data quality um, without having to know SQL, but if you do know SQL and you want to go underneath the covers and, and look at the SQL, you can do that. And we also help organizations calculate the, the business impact of data quality or uh, governance initiatives. So understand how the ba bad data affects business, identify potential savings using some what-if analysis of quality level and, and costs associated with those, and then track metrics of financial uh, impact of, of data quality issues. At SAP, we know that data governance requires access to all your data sources, so it's not just about um, you know, migrating uh, data from three uh, SAP 4.3 instances into one single ECC 6.0 instances, but we give you the ability to integrate your transactional data with email and other text data, so to do text data processing, add spatial um, geocoding to your data, so if you want to do location analysis. Uh, and of course, shared metadata ties it all together, allowing you to see the, the lineage of your data from source to report as well as impact analysis. So if I make this change in my source system, you know, how's that going to affect, affect my financial consolidation system? Those types of things. John and Bruce talked a little bit about uh, workflow. So from a master data perspective, SAP ha has a solution with pre-built data models for different uh, domains as well as uh, data governance uh, workflow built into the master data management. So you can have separation of duties between who requests a change to a particular master data item uh, who makes those changes and who ultimately approves those changes. And we really take the perspective that, that master data is the DNA of an enterprise. Um, and it really plays a, a pivotal role in enabling organizations to um, transform their businesses. So whatever their, their business strategy might be, you know, voice of the customer, um, you know, operational efficiency, uh, whatever, whatever that may be. And while companies have traditionally taken a siloed approach to master data management, focusing on customer or product data only, the changing nature of data requirements uh, are forcing companies to look more holistically at master data management, and not only across domains, but also extending uh, MDM consolidation functionality with that kind of central creation and governance capabilities. And when you talk about data governance and, and regulatory compliance, you can't just focus on data. You have to look at data and the associated content holistically. Uh, you have sales orders and email correspondences associated with your customer data. You have maintenance records and parts orders associated with asset or, or location data, uh, purchase order and invoices with vendor data, et cetera, et cetera. 
So SAP offers a solution to holistically manage data and content. Uh, by connecting records management and data lifecycle management, you can improve customer service by providing real-time access to customer information and improve compliance by ensuring data is not deleted if there's content attached to it. And uh, Bruce talked about this a little bit, but information governance that's part of day-to-day -day activities and business processes enables you to find and re remediate issues on the fly so you can govern with greater agility. So that data quality at the point of entry instead of cleaning it up later in downstream systems. So the example that Bruce gave was um, the vendor has to have a phone number associated with it. So doing that data check when data is being entered. Uh, upfront governance of, of master data creation and that uh, workflow is part of the business process. Policies for data archiving, retention, and deletion embedded into process workflow, and then the attachment of all the applicable content to the transactional data and processes. And some of the benefits of this uh, include increased compliance with both your internal and your external standards and reduced audit workloads and costs. So at this point, we're going to transition into Q&A. And just a reminder that you can enter your questions in the, in the Q&A uh, box there. We did have a couple that, that came in during the course of the presentation. Uh, so Bruce, uh, one of the questions here, you talked about your uh, ERP migration upgrade, and was that a significant driver for your governance program? It was in that as the business um, recognized how much time and effort and cost it was going to be to clean the master data up, to make it a better, you know, to really do it as part of the migration, they said we can't afford that much time and cost as part of that project. Let's deal with it after the fact, after we go live. So that's you know partly why it's okay. Let's we need to put this in place after the go live. Put in place the governance because we know we didn't do it as part of the project. So we know we need to do it now. Okay. And another one here. So how do you prioritize where to start with the different data domains? So in our case, the vendor master, in addition to being simpler, also had a, a data trustee that was very interested because he recognized they needed to be doing more with category management um, for, on the purchasing side. So I was able to help him fulfill his goals of getting the category management by getting a better understanding and better control around the vendor master data. So it's you know really looking for where is there you know, a, a, what's, you know, that expression, the burning platform, that you can try and help um, address those issues uh, where you, you're going to get a higher level of buy-in from the business. You may have noticed I haven't spent any time on finance yet, really, and that really comes back to that's one area where we did do some level of harmonization to a common chart of accounts as part of the consolidation project. So the work I need to do there is really more or less limited to we just wanted to find the governance where they did a put in place for that object of centralized governance. Um, but my return on my time spent there is going to be very low as I just fit them within the governance model. I don't need to do a lot of cleanup there. So it's, you know, what's, where's, the, where's the business need? What's the priority and the willingness of the business to engage on an individual object? Okay. And another one, how did you get support for data governance from senior management in the business? So this is one we hear all the time. Um, so the first thing was they saw when they were told by a consulting company as part of the uh, consolidation, well, here's how much it's going to cost and how long it's going to take. That certainly caught their attention. But also as we've looked at, you know, why do projects, IT projects fail? Oftentimes it's because of master data issues or why are they delayed? So we've had experience with several different projects where they did, the projects did not go as planned because of master data issues. So 
there's a you know recognition of the importance of it that even though you you know the senior management doesn't feel the pain day to day because they may have people to take care of those things um, to you know con to smooth out the reports for them before they ever see them. Um, I've actually found the lower I go in the business, the more people are interested and supportive of um, of moving ahead with the master data cleanup. So the key is how does this translate um, for a senior management into the importance for them, the value to them, what's, what kind of savings can they uh, uh, get ideally, if possible, from, um, from an, uh, an opportunity to, for a payback, but then also what can it do to increase their level of trust in the overall reporting that they're getting um, if, the, if the data is cleaned up or if the time spent on um, cleaning up invoices that went out with wrong terms because we could do it or because the rules weren't in place. That's really how you can show the value to the business. Great, thanks. And there's a, there's a couple others, and I'm going to kind of summarize them together. So uh, they're around, you know, how do you select data stewards, data owners, and, and you know, what kind of uh, positions or people are part of your steering committee? Mm-hmm. So um, the, the key part here is, number one, they need to, for a data steward, um, is that we need to do someone that both understands the details of it and can set the standards and, and, and manage it. From a steering committee level, at the highest level, um, they're not going to be involved in, except on a very exceptional basis with making any decisions, but they're the ones at the steering committee, we need the people that can help to identify the resources um, that are going to be involved in this. So when I talk about, you know, as I would take on a new object, so for example, we, um, I'm looking down at the bill of materials and the recipes. So I w first thing I did is I went to our um, VP of operations and said, you know, here's an object. It's tied to the material master. I've, made, I've been making progress in the material master. I understand that you have some interest in trying to harmonize some approaches from the business process for, for the bills of materials and recipes. So here's how I can help you know, support you. We need to get some people involved. Here's who I believe are the right people to get involved. Do you agree that it makes sense that we start work now on this object of builds materials and recipes? And would you be in agreement and supportive of having these, these people or similar type people involved in this effort you know, over a period of time? So it's really, you know, kind of have to have an idea of who do you want to have. And one of the ways we did that was even just to see, well, who's actually maintaining records? So we understood who the data custodians were, who do they report to, and then have that discussion with people in the business. Okay, well, who needs to be involved in this? So the steering committee, it's going to be senior level that can help with resource identification and um, prioritization. And then data trustee is one person globally that has um, a level of um, responsibility that even though they don't need to know all the details about the master data, they're going to be able to help facilitate discussions and standards um, and, you know, on a global basis working across the organization. Yeah, and, and again, just to echo the buy-in, um, the, the data management organization is really designed to enable the business. And whether that's through trusted reporting or process optimization, we always start with the key business drivers of the company. Uh, when we started with CSL Bearing, the Utopia team had a numerous initiatives around, um, you know, single view of the customer, around um, the, the um, Sunshine Act, which is physician spend management and the whole hierarchies of vendors. There was a global spend initiative and then multiple other um, initiatives around um, IT and ensuring that IT projects uh, didn't have business disruption due to the data. So we honed in on those, and as Bruce mentioned, he was helping someone out in the procurement organization, uh, so we tackled the vendor master. So, you know, always try to drive economic um, uh, advantage through data integrity, uh, which, which, again, all you have to say is uh, here's the business process. Eighty percent of the business process is master data. Now, once you profile that data and show them the challenges in the data with respect to data integrity by using, at the time it was data services, now it's called information steward, you've got evidence 
to show people where the challenges are, and so then they become active participants. As Bruce mentioned, one of the data stewards is someone responsible for procurement at one of their plants. So they know the, the path to meeting procurement optimization, leverage spend, is, is found in understanding who are my vendors and what are the materials and how do I you know, negotiate better terms with them through insight. So that's a big, uh, you know, one of the top things we can do to get that type of buy-in uh, by showing people the data, but also quantifying the impact of data uh, to, the, to the business. And that helps them to, you know, not only um, leverage your support from the data management organization, but ultimately to come to you actively saying, you know, Bruce, you know, or data governance organization, we need your support. And I think that's, uh, that's certainly something that um, is, is very helpful in sustaining um, the maturity and the growth of, of data governance as we've been on this four-year journey with them. Thanks, John. Well, we're, we're definitely at the top of the hour now. Uh, I want to thank you, Bruce and John, for your insights. Again, I think that it's extremely valuable to you know, hear it, hear it from the trenches, and I also want to thank the attendees for uh, participating in the in the webcast today. And I think that uh, at this point we will uh, close it down. Just w one other thing: there were a number of questions about downloading the presentation slides. Uh, the presentation slides themselves are not available for download, but the uh, webcast is recorded, and the link to that recording will be sent out to the attendees so you can view it at your leisure if there are specific areas you want to go back to at a later time. Once again, thank you very much and have a great day.